Hey, Ryan here. I've ranted for years that there isn't nearly enough emphasis on the mental and emotional aspects of losing weight and health transformation. Everyone's so obsessed with food hacks or eat this superfood to lose weight, do this exercise to burn body fat. And these things obviously have value, but if your habits, mindset, behavior, and so on don't also change, any efforts to follow a diet plan and exercise regimen are gonna be short-lived anyway. So in this video, I wanna break down some of the key mindset shifts I had myself when I lost a little bit of weight back in the day. But now also, what I've observed with my clients, I've helped nearly 500 men and women from all around the world towards their ideal healthy body weight over the last five years. I wanna take some of their biggest epiphanies share them with you. Hopefully you can inject that into your thinking going forward and it really helps you out. Mindset shift number one, not equating one mistake, one blip in your diet with, I'll never be able to do this. I'll always be overweight. This is what people do despite a couple of great weeks and months, both on and off the scale in terms of building healthy habits. They'll overindulge one time. They'll maybe binge eat once and they'll suddenly get all down on themselves and all doomsday about this. And you can't afford to do that. You must zoom out when you make mistakes. Think of that mistake as a drop in the bucket of your overall diet. Recognize how well you're doing overall so you can pick yourself back up and feel positive again about getting back on track. Instead of that kind of, oh, screw it, I failed now. Give me that shocky cake anyway. I'm just always destined to be struggling with this stuff. I'm never gonna be, who was I kidding? I'm never gonna be consistent. You can't afford to be like that. You have to be bullish with this stuff. And I guess for me personally, I don't resonate with this. I see this in my clients. I don't resonate with this particular one because I was always kind of naive and perhaps slightly delusional. I'd like binge out on my diet. I'd be doing well for five days and then I'd suddenly smash. I couldn't give it. I just gave in for one reason or another and I'd smash down a whole pack of Pop-Tarts, for example, 1,800, 2,000 calories worth of Pop-Tarts. Weirdly, from the next meal, I would be able to psych myself up again and I'd be able to say to myself, no, I do believe I can do this. I'm back on track. I can do this. I am going to get the body I want. I'm in this for the long haul. And that's kind of frankly delusional because my track record was showing me that I couldn't actually be that consistent. But that's the kind of almost bullish <laughs> naivety that I want you guys to have. Push through, zoom out, look at the rest of your diet, see that you're going the right way overall. Don't dramatize one little mistake. Mindset shift number two, actually admitting that I wasn't really happy with myself and I wasn't really proud of both my physique, my body, as superficial as it sounds, but also my habits, feeling kind of chaotic and out of control with food. I felt embarrassed and ashamed of that. Like that wasn't quite good enough for me. And I think this is, for me, was a massive prerequisite for change. It would be easy to stay in denial. Ignorance is bliss, as they say, but I had to actually face those things, feel the pain of them, feel how much they did annoy me about myself. And that created massive motivation to actually go and change. And interestingly, I think this is frankly the antithesis of a lot of this new age thinking now around self-love and self-acceptance, which in fairness, I do think has its place and has value. But at the same time, I see it as a, a, a pendulum that needs swinging. I think we are massively, my observation is we are massively motivated by things we don't like about ourselves and our lives too, uh, as well as that sort of typical positive motivation. Oh, there's where I want to go. I want to get this thing. I want to be this way. I think we are equally, if not more, motivated by escaping the pain that we're currently in. So for me, that was a big one. And this is tricky territory, right? This is a gray area because you start, if you don't want to start siphoning off your sense of pride and fulfillment and, and worthiness to some distant point in the future. Like, oh, I'll be happy, I'll feel deserving, I'll feel good about myself when I've lost the weight or I'm a millionaire or I've got X car or I've finally got a lovely girlfriend, etc. You don't wanna siphon off all of that stuff and future pace it. But at the same time, feeling that pain, being disappointed, frankly, in yourself can be a great motivator for change, I've found. Number three, actually caring about health just as much, if not more, as weight loss, as the physical form, the physical transformation. And I think what this allows us to do is seek out strategies that are far more, uh, let's say, holistic and sustainable for us. They have longevity baked into them. We actually have a chance of staying consistent with them rather than all the quick fixes, the uh, get rich quick scheme, weight loss equivalents, whatever they might be, the stuff that is promised to provide immediate results because it's so aggressive. And I could finally personally draw some boundaries with those really extreme aggressive approaches once I finally realized, oh, it's about health too, which I know doesn't sound particularly profound, but frankly, it was profound to me at 21. And I just equated slimness with health 
rather than, oh no, there's also stuff, there's markers on the inside too, such as getting your blood work done that can show, hey, you're not going the right way. And I had my really bad acne at the time and I was overweight, but I was never obese. So I kind of felt like, well, oh, I'm fit, I'm young, I can, I can run, I can do a bit of running, I go to the gym, I'm okay, right? Well, no, absolutely not, not necessarily. Um, and so for me, that all switched because I was doing a lot of the flexible dieting stuff, as many of you know, if you've been following me for a little while. So I was sneaking junk food, naughty stuff into my diet, having an awful lot of meat and dairy back then, an awful lot of saturated fat in my diet. And it wasn't until I happened across the likes of the China study, um, Dan Butner's work on, on blue zones, that I was like, oh, Health matters too. And this allowed me to find weight loss approaches that were far more sustainable. Next one, you're not saying no to them, you're saying yes to you. And I like this particularly as a reframe in social settings. Bottom line is it's okay to put yourself first and you need to give yourself permission to do that. Because I think sometimes we do get strange looks when we go out for pizza night and we just order the healthy salad. And sometimes people will try and guilt trip us. Sometimes we'll guilt trip ourselves. We'll feel bad for breaking the expectations other people have of us, for not sharing that bottle of wine with them. We'll almost feel like we're depriving them. That's so wrong, right? We're just putting our health first and that's a really noble, important and, excuse me, important thing to do. So to feel any kind of guilt or story of selfish, selfishness for that is so unfair and it's so wrong, but it is how sometimes we feel when we're trying to sort things out and clean up our diets and we head into social situations. And we do get those strange looks and sometimes a little bit of a, a hard time for doing what we're doing. So I really like that phrase. You're not saying no to them. You're not taking away anything away from them. They might perceive that, but you're not. They can still eat the thing they want to eat but you're just saying yes to you. It's a vote for your health. Mindset shift number five, understanding that cravings really don't last that long. Um, physical hunger lasts and absolutely should be answered. I just wanna make that distinction. I'm talking about cravings driven by emotionality or deep-rooted habit. Um, these are actually extremely temporary and fleeting. They don't feel like it. They feel incredibly overwhelming, very urgent, almost like this itch that you need to scratch. For me, back in the day, it was almost like I couldn't focus on the rest of my day until I'd taken care of my craving. That's how it felt. Until I'd had the tub of Ben and Jerry's, the couple of pop darts, a couple of biscuits. It's like I couldn't get on with the rest of my day. I couldn't even focus on anything else. That's how overwhelming and powerful it felt to me at the time. What was amazing when I first started becoming far more aware of my eating habits and behavioral patterns is if I just rode out the craving, if I just delayed for maybe 20 to 30 minutes, I would say I'm speaking very anecdotally, but perhaps 50% of the time after that 20 to 30 minutes was up, the craving was gone entirely. And I realized, oh, that really was something that can just pass. It really was fleeting. Um, but they feel so strong and powerful in the moment. So yeah, cravings really don't last all that long. You just need to push through. The next one is understanding that most of your problems to do with the mental and emotional aspects of food choices. So again, cravings, emotional eating, deeply held beliefs and attitudes and associations with food, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of these things are resolved only with consistency. And sometimes you do need, don't get me wrong, new reframes, I've given you some here, new ways to think about things and strategies and hacks. But frankly, when you're consistent, that's when your behavior actually starts to change to the point where being consistent actually becomes your default. Essentially just repeating good habits week in, week out. And all of a sudden you realize, hey, I don't binge eat that much anymore. Hey, I don't actually have that many cravings anymore. And Oftentimes I feel like a lot of dieters are looking for a thing, a silver bullet that will allow them to be consistent. Whereas for the past couple of years, I've always felt that consistency is the silver bullet. It is the thing that fixes the things that stop you from being consistent, if that makes sense, because of how consistency compounds, because of how your taste buds, habits, gut bacteria, resilience, discipline, habits, I think I already said that, just positive mindset, etc. how these things compound and momentum builds when you just repeat good behavior, and all of a sudden you've resolved a great deal of the mental and emotional afflictions and weaknesses that you had around food. And I say this because I think right now the in thing is the in theory is that you need to again heal, uh, fix stories. And when I say heal, I'm talking figuratively, I'm talking maybe spiritually, I'm talking mentally. Heal, um, you need to feel a sense of worthiness. 
Uh, you need a sense of deserving, and this will allow you to fix your emotional eating. And you need this new reframe, and this new mindset, and this new belief system, and this will allow you to fix your emotional eating and your cravings and be more consistent. And I just, I think some of that has value, don't get me wrong, but I've just never taken that view. I think consistency is actually the thing that fixes those things. Number seven, and this one relates to exercise, understanding that exercise becomes self-motivating at a certain point, the feedback loop that takes over with exercise when you're at a certain level of proficiency, when you start getting good, in other words, at an exercise, is really, really awesome. And I love eating well. It makes me feel amazing and it motivates me to continue eating well because I feel so good. But I have to admit that exercise has an addictiveness to it, I find, that nutrition simply doesn't. And don't get me wrong, there are still, I'm a bloody human, right? There are still moments where I'm like, oh, I don't really want to go to the gym today. Uh, last week, I was like, oh, the weather's so bad, I don't know if I want to really go and hit tennis balls today. Um, but frankly, those moments are few and far between nowadays, and I definitely, have, I definitely have to negotiate with myself more to make sure I eat a healthy meal versus a bad one than I have to with exercise. I've noticed that. And yes, exercise is habitual now, so that's part of it, but that's not the point I'm making. I'm not talking about exercise being a habit. I'm talking about when you actually start progressing with exercise, it's amazing how we enjoy the things that we're good at in life, I've always thought. It, when you, so when you start progressing with exercise, then by extension, it kind of starts to justify its existence in your life and it starts to motivate itself. It starts to incentivize you to just continue to keep doing it. So what I would say with exercise is you need to do exercise to the point because a lot of people hate exercise, especially when they're just beginning. But there is, I think the advice I want to give is that there is this light at the end of the tunnel. After a couple of months, when you start getting better at it, when you start actually observing, hey, I'm getting fitter here, I'm getting better at the particular sport or movement that I'm doing, my form is better in the gym, I'm lifting heavier weights. Even if you hate exercise right now, and this sounds hard to believe, trust me, you'll get so addicted to that process that it actually is sometimes harder to stop doing exercise and take a break than it is to continue. Our penultimate mindset shift here, the scales, do matter. Stop avoiding them to spare your feelings. I've got a pretty no-nonsense approach on this. And look, I get it. People that say, oh, the scales affect my mental health. Oh, the scales actually dissuade me from eating well because I feel so low about myself when I step on the scale that I don't really feel motivated to eat well. I do understand and I do empathize, but at the same time, I think this is a reality check that we need. I think the scale is a measure of your overall health and well-being. And if you are overweight and obese right now, and you are avoiding the scale, I want to challenge you on this. You're avoiding the discomfort that comes with knowing that things might have got out of hand and that you might now need to change. That's what you're avoiding. You're not avoiding the scale, you're avoiding the associated stories and feelings and the guilt complex that can come with, hey, look, I'm overweight, this is bad, now I don't feel good about myself. That then, of course, needs to be channeled into something positive, don't get me wrong, and I can see where people struggle with that. But avoiding the scale, is that really the solution? It's such imp an important method of accountability for monitoring progress. I just don't think that's appropriate. And then there's also people, they're not making necessarily a mental and emotional argument, they're making the argument of, well, Ryan, fat loss doesn't always show on the scale. And whilst that is very true in the short term, I won't deny that in the short term, generally over the medium to long term, that's not correct. When you're losing body fat, that will show on the scale over the medium to long term, with the obvious exception being uh, that you're putting on pounds and pounds of muscle, but that's not likely for most folks. Generally speaking, if you're losing body fat over the medium to long term, you might not see that between a Friday and a Saturday when you're stepping on the scale, but over the medium to long term, you are going to see that scale drop. So if you're trying to just judge yourself from the mirror, I agree that it is possible to assess if your strategy is working from the mirror or not when you're already quite slim and lean because you can actually see uh, what a one or two pound difference looks like. But if you've got upwards, I would say, of 20 pounds to lose, I think the scale is a really important feedback system. And so for you to avoid that, to spare your feelings or under some notion that fat loss doesn't always show on the scale, I don't think that's quite right. And lastly, our final mindset shift for this video. I hope this stuff has been useful, by the way, so far, and it's given you pardon the pun, food for thought. Emotional eating is just as much about familiarity as it is taste. And I think once we internalize this, we can take foods that have a hold on us, foods that we feel 
we're addicted to or have an affliction for or a weakness for, we can take them off their proverbial pedestal, help them lose the magic spell they have over us. That kind of story that we need these foods. I'm a chocoholic. Think about the words that I'm a chocoholic. How disempowering is that? I can't live without wine. I love my Friday wine night. All of this self-talk, it makes it inevitable for us to eat poorly, right? If that's how we speak to ourselves and think of ourselves. And there's a lot to say on this subject of emotional eating, there is. The particular point I wanna make today though is emotional eating is just as much about familiarity as it is taste. Um, familiarity because we love routines, because we're creatures of habit. Uh, I ask you now to reflect on those moments where you are bored or stressed or seeking comfort, seeking soothing. Think about the type of foods that you turn to and I can almost guarantee that you go for very specific foods. It's not broad, you don't just wanna eat any junk food, you wanna eat a specific type of food. I almost guarantee it, even down to the brand in some cases. For me back in the day, I wasn't happy with any old ice cream. I didn't want vanilla ice cream, Wool's vanilla ice cream, Tesco vanilla ice cream. I wanted Ben and Jerry's cookie dough. I wouldn't even accept any other Ben and Jerry's. If they were all out of Ben and Jerry's cookie dough in the store, I didn't even want ice cream. I'd just go and grab something else. When I wanted biscuits or cookies, it had to be either hobnobs or Oreos. I went through a phase of Bourbon biscuits as well. I remember those, they're a bit outdated. I don't know if everyone around the, know, the world knows uh, the good old Bourbon, but yeah, so, so specific. And that's one characteristic of emotional hunger rather than physical hunger where you'll just eat whatever because you want nutrients. You'll throw together the strangest concoction of healthy foods and be really happy with it because you're so desperate to eat something. Physical, uh, excuse me, emotional hunger rather and cravings, they're very different. They're very niche, they're very specific. It's, I want this particular food, why? I ask you to think why, because it's about familiarity, it's about comfort, it's because we are associating these foods with certain feelings because we perhaps used those foods in the past when we had certain feelings. So it all becomes part through association of this behavioral script. I'm stressed, I eat Ben and Jerry's cookie dough. And once you've done that a few times, once you've repeated that pattern a few times, well then it's a cycle, isn't it? Then your brain's like, hold on, we're stressed. When we're stressed, we usually eat Ben and Jerry's cookie dough. That's what we do, Ryan. And it feels so inevitable. It again, feels like this, this train that you simply can't get off the tracks, that you can't stop. And this is why I make the argument that emotional eating is just as much about familiarity as it is taste. When you are feeling charged, when you're feeling emotional and you're having cravings, I challenge you right now, think about how niche and specific the certain foods that you want when you have those cravings are. It isn't vague, it isn't broad, you don't just want to eat anything, you won't accept anything. Someone could offer you some apple, you might have a bit of it, but it doesn't turn you on like Pop-Tarts do or like Ben and Jerry's cookie dough does. And that's because there's a nostalgia and there's a pattern recognition that comes with those certain foods because we've used them as a crutch. Falsely thinking that they're the thing that resolves the stress or the boredom, the loneliness, the comfort that we need, the pick me up, etc., 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 through association. So I think when we understand this, and yes, this food, again, still tastes good to us. Taste plays a role here, I'm not denying that. But when we understand that it's also just a bit of a pattern, it's just comfort, it is just, we know that food, it's safe, it has a, it, we know that we enjoy it enough, and so it's kind of like a guaranteed win, let's say, to have that food, rather than risking having a new food. Once you realize you're also selecting that item out of familiarity, well, I think that helps you take away some of the power that it has over you, or so is my theory. So cravings, emotional eating, just as much about familiarity and patterns as they are taste. I'm in no position to tell you how to think. I would never have the audacity to tell another individual precisely how they should be thinking. Um, I am not a psychologist. I certainly don't consider myself a, a mindset guru or expert. I'm no Tony Robbins. But hand on heart, the stuff I've just shared with you, a great percentage of it personally changed my life. A lot of these principles and ideas and reframes, I'm just looking through my notes now, a lot of this stuff honestly has been crucial to me um, getting in much better shape. And the stuff that wasn't personal to me is stuff that I'm watching my clients, improve my clients' lives right now. Um, so maybe I'm tooting, tooting my own horn a little bit too much here, but what I've just shared with you, I think frankly is really good stuff, <laughs> if I don't say so myself. And look, even if you don't take it on board, even if you don't agree with it, Hopefully there was a lot of food for thought here. Hopefully there's stuff you can go away, mull over, and then if it feels right to you, if it resonates, you can start changing 
how you think about some of this stuff. So yeah, hopefully it was useful. If you do want that extra level of guidance, accountability and support, and if you wanna work with me personally to help improve your relationship with food, to get over the hump with things like cravings and emotional eating and self-sabotage and limiting beliefs, um, fill out the form down below. I'll be in touch to let you know, in the description box rather down below, I'll be in touch to let you know more information about my Slim and Sustain program, where I can walk you through this entire process one-on-one. -on -one. I don't do any of that group coaching outsourcing nonsense. You work with me directly. I take responsibility for you and we're gonna have a personal relationship. So the link for that will be down below. See you soon.